And thank you all who have tuned in from wherever you might be around the globe. This is the wonderful advantage of having a virtual event rather than an in-person event is that it can include, include people from way far away. So if anybody's tuned in from Australia, let us know. <laughs> I think it's tomorrow in Australia in any case. So it's a particular pleasure to be uh, hosting, the, to be having this launch in conjunction with Malaprops, which is the spot where I bought my very first cookbook in 1982, I believe, the year that Malaprops opened its doors, uh, which means that Malaprops is celebrating almost 40 years in business now. And that cookbook, of course, was The Joy of Cooking because that's um, the classic cookbook. It's been my go-to all my life, all my cooking life. And uh, even in France, where I lived for 20 years, if I needed a recipe, a go-to recipe, I would go to The Joy, uh, believe it or not, even with all the great cookbooks that were on hand in France. So to get to the subject at hand now, um, the truffle book came about, ha, huh, through a circuitous uh, um, bunch of pathways. Um, I will resort to the dedication here just now to tell you that this book is for the chef who has plunged unexpectedly into cooking with truffles and also for the home cook who seeks some overarching guidelines to experimenting with this precious tuber. It also is for anyone looking for a collection of simple, doable, everyday recipes which can be confected just as well with or without the truffle. So you don't have to have a truffle in your kitchen. If you don't, they're fine with any mushroom or with no mushrooms at all or with whatever uh, your favorite ingredient is that you might want to highlight that day. Most importantly, it is a tribute to the truffle farmers who have worked and watched and waited in blind faith for their first and following crops to come to fruition, who are brave enough to embrace the seemingly impossible passion, who have generously shared their experiences with me along the way. And for the truffle itself, that dark, deep, mysterious nugget that signifies the deliciousness hidden in each one of us. So I would like to pass the word on just for a moment to my friend Mark Rosenstein, who is here. Uh, most of you, if you are from Asheville, know Mark Rosenstein. And if you're not from Asheville, it's about time you um, got to know him. Mark is considered the father of the farm to table restaurant approach in Western North Carolina. He's a chef, innovator, and author, always on the leading edge of the next best thing to serve humanity. With 50 years in the restaurant business since opening the Frog and Owl Cafe in the Highlands, North Carolina in 72, and his flagship restaurant, The Marketplace in Asheville in 79, he has actively fostered the link between grower, chef, and diner at a time when the concept had not yet hit the mainstream. In the dozen years since passing his uh, flagship restaurant, The Marketplace, on to William Disson, he has spearheaded Go Kitchen Ready, a teaching program aimed at lifting people trapped by poverty and self-sufficiency through their culinary skills. He's played an instrumental role in designing the avant-garde Smoky Park Supper Club and is currently working with a team at the Southside Kitchen, collaborating with We Give a Share to provide meals to people facing food insecurity. So uh, I'd like to give Mark just a moment to speak to the subject of the day because we met, uh, strangely enough, in Italy over a truffle event that was hosted by Slow Food, um, uh, Slow Food Europe. Um, and uh, actually, I looked him up in Italy because I was living in France at the time, and I knew he was from Asheville, and I wanted him to teach for my culinary school, and the only way I could find to connect to him was to go to Italy. So um, that was a fun first meeting. I remember, uh, I remember that day <laughs> yesterday. What a pleasant, passion what a pleasant for truffles day. ever since. Yeah. Well, uh, good afternoon. And Susie, thank you for that wonderful introduction. And if I can back up for 30 seconds and say a few things about Susie, um, who I guess it was in 2006 was the event that she was talking about. So we've known each other uh, 16, 17 years, something like that. Um, Susie has written three books, um, uh, one of which we're celebrating today but another one that you should read is called Child of the Woods. And it's something that she wrote about 25 years ago. And it gave me a deeper insight into who this wonderful individual is. And if there's a definition of kindness 
and um, authenticity uh, and pure joy of uh, the everyday events of the world, uh, I think Susie is, is that individual and it, it really is well expressed in her recollection of her uh, early formative years having been born uh, up in Tater Gap uh, in uh, Madison County, North Carolina, and she represents a true mountain spirit. So I'm, I'm delighted to be um, a friend of hers and to be here today. So thank you, Susie. Amen. Yeah. And that kitchen behind her is not a prop. That's the real thing. <laughs> and it's only a part of it. Hello, Tom. Hey there, Mark. How are we doing there? I'm doing well. Yeah. So um, it's just amazing to me how people come together and how things link together and sort of they take that underground rooting experience that uh, produces a truffle. I'm going to let Tom speak to that in a moment because he's the expert. Um, but for those of you who haven't met Tom, um, uh, there's so many things to say about him. I'm gonna, I know I have to keep this short today because it's a, a going to go quickly this hour. Um, Tom's a plant pathologist with a doctorate in mycology. He's brought the elusive tuber melanosporum, my favorite of all the truffles available, grown in the unlikely hills of East Tennessee to chefs such as Daniel Boulou and other high profile players in New York, Atlanta, Boston, and even in Paris. He's been featured in the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal, Gentleman, Gentleman's Quarterly, among other notable publications. And um, while he personally is not producing as many truffles as he once was uh, due to uh, a series of unexpected events, um, <laughs> which uh, are always plaguing the truffle grower. Um, My truffle you know, they grow where they want to, when they want to. Exactly. Um, he continues to inspire and consult and experiment with the ingredient in question and to um, do an amazing job at taming that uh, uh, perpetual anxiety of the farmer. So Tom, uh, can you tell us a little bit uh, for anybody who is not familiar with the truffle as in the underground truffle, what a truffle is? Well, you, you well, the main thing about the actually, um, maybe I could start, now this is just random stream of consciousness uh, stuff here. I, I'm not that I can't hear you too well. Can this everybody is, hear you? Uh, is that better if I speak closer to the microphone? Yes. Yeah, okay, well, this is kind of uh, maybe a little bit random stream of consciousness. Uh, I tend to be a little bit scattered sometimes, so so please for, forgive that. Uh, what, for example, part of the stream of consciousness was when you said something about the, the unusualness of the truffle and what it actually is. Uh, first, that thought came to mind in the stream of consciousness was, uh, I got a call one day from a lady uh, somewhere near Nashville, and um, I forget all the details of the call, but she wanted to know um, why I wanted to put uh, chocolate into the ground <laughs> <laughs> in terms of how to grow truffles. So, uh, so there is a bit of an education uh, involved here. Uh, I, I, um, for myself, um, I actually, many people come to, uh, to truffles out of uh, basically uh, the passion for for food and the je ne sais quoi of the truffle and what have you, uh, basically the art, the, I mean, the truffle is at the top of uh, the food, the gustatory food chain, I guess you might say. It's, uh, and I, I don't say that, uh, I don't say that lightly, but for myself, uh, I didn't come from a, to truffles from that, uh, you know, romantic point of view. I came to them uh, out of necessity. Uh, and uh, the situation was, was I did, uh, my first love was the little button mushroom, which uh, um, is a little bit sadly maligned, but, uh, but I was passionate about trying to solve uh, button mushroom diseases. And I couldn't find uh, funding to do that when I applied to graduate school, but lo and behold, uh, a couple bankers uh, from California said, sitting on their yacht off the coast of France, eating some truffles said, well, why can't we do this in the United States? And so 
uh, it just turned out I'm walking the hallways looking for money, and they funded Oregon State University with the grant to uh, develop the, uh, the some initial, you know, very preliminary work on how we might start a truffle industry in the United States. So, so I kind of came at it uh, just saying, well, that's cool. My father was a mushroom grower, but I guess I can uh, do him one better now and <laughs> try to grow truffles. Susie, so uh, how, how, Susie, how did how did you meet the truffle? <laughs> well, there's a there's a little passage of the book that I will read to you because it is um, um, my introduction to this uh, be this beautiful beast here. Um, Again, it's a circuitous route. Uh, it was back in uh, 2007, so just after I met you, actually, Mark, um, that I fell deeply and irrevocably in love with the truffles. The month was January, and a chilly mistral swept over the gray, soft curves of a wintry Provence, carrying with it the scent of wild rosemary, thyme, and the tang of wood smoke rising from kitchen fires spelled by fed by the sarmon, which is the discarded grapevines left over from the orchard trim. I'd made the trek by train from Paris an hour north of my then home in the Loire, spending, speeding through the fields of winter wheat past pastures inhabited by Charolais, the prized beef cattle that were inhabiting the central and southern eastern, southeastern France under towering remains of the medieval castles long abandoned by their lords and ladies Past village after village, each one clustered around an ancient church built out of stone and out of faith. The Clos d'Allery is where I landed, ferried from the railway station in the dark of night by the tall, slender figure of Natalie in her teckle spaniel, Ubu. The vehicle was an old farm truck, and it rattled and shook like any good working companion. It smelled like dogs and saucisson and something else dusky and musky and enchanting. That something else was truffles, specifically the Perigord truffle, which Tom has uh, so dedicated his life to. Uh, Tuber Molenosporum, that mysterious fungal beast also known by the moniker Black Gold, Black Diamond, Black Princess, French Black Winter Truffle, Truche du Perigord, fruity, musky, floral, earthy, pungent, feral, elusive, captivating. Once it grabs your senses, you are lost or found forever. So after that, I came home and I looked up what was happening in my absence in the New York Times and I ran across a piece called Coveted French and Now in Tennessee, which highlighted none other than Tom Michaels, who was growing truffles right over the hill from where I grew up in Western North Carolina here in Madison County. So um, the next time I came back to the States, I called up Mark and said, hey, could you possibly help me find this truffle grower over in East Tennessee? And we went over on a truffle hunt to Tom's orchard. And that's how we ran across Tom, just as his heyday was beginning. Um, so yeah, Tom, t can you tell us just a, 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 a couple, you know, two or three minutes more about what the uh, Tuber Millennium is and why we should be passionate about it and where it's growing these days in the US? Uh, let me hold, just hold that thought for just a second. I just want to say that that had it not been for Susie, I would have not. I would have been totally clueless about food and the Asheville uh, restaurant scene. And Asheville, this is a plug for the, for the Asheville Chamber of Commerce. It's a great place if you want to go and uh, go and you know some great restaurants. Just an awesome town for food. But uh, Susie connected me into a lot of that, and I really appreciate that. Mm. So, and so I just, I, I would have been still just a little farmer out here honing to my, trying to slap a few truffles around. I would have not been connected to this fantastic network of chefs that is around our area. One would never think of Bashville as a, perhaps, you know, being placed out in the sticks uh, as a culinary destination, but it, uh, it really is. And uh, Susie's a big part of uh, making all that happen. So, um, so what the what the truffle is? I don't know how I can segue into that, but uh, but uh, we'll we'll do the best we can. Uh, the one of the things uh, I guess I don't want to really get into the biology. Because 
cactus that much, except to say that it's, uh, if you imagine an underground mushroom, it's a mushroom that kind of does what it does underground, uh, looks a little like a potato uh, that happened, that has had a hard time. Uh, <laughs> it, it really, it's very, very knobby, very gnarly, uh, but it's part of its uh, survival strategy to be very hard and, and, and weather resistant, uh, to be able to survive in the soil and, and look like a potato. Uh, what you might be uh, interested, because I know there's uh, most of the people listening to this are involved with food, is that the truffle is biologically very closely related to the morel. And uh, for those of us that have hunted morels, and <laughs> sometimes with better luck uh, some days than others, uh, but uh, those that have hunted morels, uh, I find that a little bit interesting. So, so it, it's, it belongs to the same group of fungi and in, in a certain way, it's almost as hard to grow as the, as the morels. Um, we got a little bit luckier with the truffles. Uh, we, we are, and all I could say about the biology to give you the big picture of it is in terms of how we, un we don't understand the biology of it, uh, except for a small fraction But uh, the way I, I like to say it is what we do with when we're trying to grow truffles is we are st somebody that was like trying to grow the button mushroom uh, 200 years ago. We uh, don't even uh, germinate the spores to make nice little truffle varieties and truffle strains and truffles that taste good and, you know, get ways to get lots and lots of trouble. We just are unable to do that because our knowledge base is so uh, it's so very, it's just not really much there. I and love that you say that truffle growing is 1% mastery and 99% mystery. Yes, or uh, I, I up the percentage a little bit. I'll give a few more percent to say it's maybe 5% <laughs> science and 90% and, uh, art. And, and, and I, don't, I, I don't mean to say that flippantly, it really is. And so if you want to grow truffles, if you're interested in, in looking at the, at the farm and the end of the farm to table situation, uh, just be alert that it's, it's, it's not for the faint hearted. You can go, someone will tell you, oh, you do A, B, and then you do C, and then you do D, and then voila, you've got truffles. Uh, not it's so an much. alphabet soup. B yeah. B <laughs> so what, uh, my my question for both of you, um, is, but particularly Susie, from the chef's point of view, what what is so alluring about the truffle? So Why aren't we you... lucky that the truffle, while it is so absolutely potent and powerful and wonderful in its little tiny nugget of a size uh, for all its cost, it pairs most elegantly with the simplest of ingredients, pasta, potatoes, rice, cream, eggs, things that you have in your pantry every day. And a little bit goes a really long way. So that's the next question. What do you do with this truffle once you find it? And uh, it's, you know, it's, there's a lot between finding it and doing something with it because, um, of course, once it's been planted, and this is Tom's part, it has the soil has to be limed, it has to be tended, it has to be husbanded for up to perhaps 10 years and kept from the varmints. And then you have to have a trained dog to get it out and you have to market it within 10 days of pulling it out of the soil or it's going to spoil. Yep. So the reason behind the writing of this book is actually, uh, <laughs> It, I think it's a sin to mistreat this truffle once it's taken 10 years of uh, absolute anxiety to bring out of the soil by not knowing what to do with it. So my hope is that for those who have not had a chance to experiment at large with the truffle, which is most people in, this, in America in any case, unless you happen to live in New York City and work for a fine restaurant where truffles are brought in every day, that this helps to uh, demystify a little bit uh, some of the very, very simple um, um, do's and don'ts that make a truffle sing uh, and keep it from being obscured by putting everything in the pot. May I, may I, you alluded to the fact your the motivation to be able 
to show people how to pair the truffle with the food and, and put it all together. And uh, I'm, I'm gonna go and, and back up one little bit. We have to, as a truffle farmer, pair the truffle to the chef. Because a truffle, every truffle, this is, this is what's so cute about the truffle. You look at another mushroom, they all look the same. Uh, they all kind of taste the same. But every truffle you pull out of the ground or your dog helps you pull out of the ground is, uh, has a different aroma profile. There's, there's about, to get into the chemistry, but there's dozens of different compounds that make up this bouquet that constitutes the, the attractiveness of the truffle. But sometimes the bouquet, the compounds are, 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 are maybe, you gotta use a little wine lingo here, I guess. Uh, sometimes they're floral or sometimes they're more fruity. Or sometimes they're more earthy and then and then you find out that, uh, well, this chef, uh, Mark there, he likes the earthy and the musky ones. And the old Linton in Atlanta, he likes the lighter, floral, fruity ones. <laughs> um, I, think, I think the truffles I liked are the ones that you brought me that, you know, I was, hap I was happy to have them. Um, and, and, you know, it, it's a... A limited experience, especially here in the south or the southeast or in the mountains, to get your hands on truffles. But for me, the experience has always been the aromatics, the headiness of it. It's not something that um, you shave them or put them in scrambled eggs or whatever, and you are getting the taste. It's like the bouquet of a great aged red burgundy that there's nothing else like it in the world. Well, the, the, you know, the nose goes straight to your limbic centers and your pleasure centers. And your right, body. yeah. And, it, it, and that's the thing, the aroma, it's all volatiles. It's, right. You, know, you, buy, you eat a mushroom and you actually get the taste of the protein and all that other stuff. It's, they're not volatile, but the truffle, the, the, what makes it so uh, fantastic is that it, 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 it's all in the aromas they're volatile and they just go straight to your uh yeah place. Susie what what is your most memorable or one of your memorable truffle experiences do you I have, would have to say you, starting out uh going down to Provence and going to the truffle markets in Provence and going into the orchards and tasting truffles in the air because as Mark said, and Tom, they are so volatile. They fill up your nostrils. And when you're in the room with a truffle or in the presence of a truffle anywhere, it's all around you. You feel like you're being bathed in velvet. So if, uh, if you're in a kitchen with a truffle, um, it's not only going into the dish, it's, it's inspiring you to do all kinds of things that you might not dream of otherwise, which is why it's considered um, also, <laughs> something you might want to give your partner if you yeah. want to have an extra special <laughs> evening. Um, my, my most memorable uh, truffle experience, I slept with a truffle. And, <laughs> and uh, in Smart 2008 man. or nine, I, I took a group from Asheville to Tuscany with Reed Finley. And he had been there before. And it, at my suggestion, I said, maybe we could arrange a truffle hunt because that's the season. So we were able to uh, hire a truffle hunter with his little dog and he took us somewhere and I was pretty sure he wasn't taking us to a prime area, but that's fine. And we found a few and ended up at lunch uh, at the end of our hunt directly across the headquarters of the White Truffle of Tuscany. And I asked our interpreter who lived in the area, I said, what is that little building across the street? Because I saw the word truffle. As it turned out, as I mentioned, it was the headquarters. So I said, let's go. So he and I went over and walked into this tiny room and there were two or three um, farmer looking individuals, you know, they had their heavy coats on and their hiking boots looking at us like, who are you? And we, we were able to convince them to sell us a number of truffles that had been collected that day. And I have to back up by mentioning when we walked in the room, as you mentioned, Susie, it's like being bowled over and bathed in velvet. 
So we bought these truffles with the plan to cook them and serve them to our group the next day. We had arranged handmade pasta to be made, hoping that we would find truffles and just do the pasta and butter with shaved truffles and fresh Parmesan. So we took them home and I put them in a jar uh, and they were so aromatic. They filled my bedroom with the aroma. I could not sleep at all. So I may be, I don't know, I may be the only chef that can say I've slept with a truffle. But, uh, <laughs> and you know what? You that's never, all I'm saying. Yeah. And this and, is the beauty of a truffle. And, you know, people are intimidated because they're so expensive. Right. And they are yeah. expensive. Right. Um, yeah. You know, you can pay $70 to $80 an ounce um, or a lot more for a truffle. You can get them for less sometimes, maybe $50 an ounce, depends on what time of year, what type of truffle and who you're going through. Right. But an ounce of a truffle is about the size of a walnut. Two ounces is about the size of an egg, if I'm um, picturing it right. And you can do a lot with an ounce of truffle. You can put it in your refrigerator in a jar with eggs and it will infiltrate the egg uh, shell and your eggs will taste like truffles overnight. You can put it in with cream, you can store it with butter, you can store it with uh, any fat soluble ingredient and it will lend its flavor. And then all you have to do is use a little bit of it to give that extra uh, toothiness of the truffle itself to augment your plate. So when you think about what you pay when you go out to a restaurant, if you go to a, a restaurant that serves truffles, you're going to pay an enormous amount per dish. You could buy yourself one little one ounce truffle and you could eat on it for a week or two right. and uh, have multiple dishes, um, which is why you need this book, right? <laughs> because this will give you all kinds of ideas of what you can do with a truffle if you've not had one in your hand. And if you have had the pleasure of playing with truffles, which um, a lot of chefs have, uh, even in Asheville, we've, uh, we've had several truffle events in Asheville, thanks to Franklin and Betty Garland, who got the truffle festival started, oh, however many years ago it was, 10 or so years ago, um, um, of which I took the reins uh, a few years back. Now it's called the Asheville Truffle Experience. But in any case, uh, several of Asheville tr uh, chefs have had the pleasure of playing with truffles. William Disson, of course, who took over Mark's uh, Marketplace restaurant uh, is one of them. Um, and um, it takes a while, even if you're a trained chef, if you know a lot about flavors, it takes a while to realize um, that simple is best, really. Uh, you don't have to overkill your uh, dish with all the ingredients that you have in your kitchen. Acidity and uh, spiciness kind of fights with the flavor, so you want to dial back on that and really um, you know, the, the, the very, very simplest truffle recipes with eggs and cream, pasta, uh, uh, potatoes, those are the ones that make the truffle sing the most. The basic so. for rice recipes right here. <laughs> right. This is uh, page 101, 100 and 101. Truffle fried rice, crayfish and truffle jambalaya, truffle risotto, my favorite. I just adore truffles and, and risotto. And Tom, I have a question for you. What, as a uh, purveyor and a grower of truffles, what recommendations do you have for someone who wants to buy a truffle? When should they buy it? What do they look for? What should they say to the seller? What should they accept oh. and what should they not accept? Boy, you know what? You've got a, uh, that is a unique position to be in to be able to to make all those uh, conditions because typically you poor chefs out there until we had some local truffles around you'd order a truffle from new york or you know one of the distributors or wherever and um very often i think they kind of treated uh many of the you know non-city folks as just the rubes out in the country they're going to sell their, their totally their, you know we in the in the trade of produce you call them seconds when they're kind of not the primary number of <clears throat> products. And so you end up taking whatever you get. Right. And then, and then you're, um, and then it hurts because then you're putting that truffle out on a plate and someone is, uh, your reputation is on the darn thing. <laughs> and you guys kind of got stuck. Yeah. But so, uh, so you, is there a, 
Is there a length of time? So again, I, I understand there's a ripeness curve yes. for a truffle. Well, and I've experienced it when it was literally, I was transformed into another realm this, by this, this most, great most truffle. You, you, this is most interesting, Mark. Uh, every, you have to remember all, everybody listening here that the truffle that is plucked out of the ground is still alive and it's still growing still making new aroma compounds even after it's out of the ground it's, it's just like you know a potato has storage nutrients with starch and what have you well a truffle has its storage nutrients and it's still using them making all these beautiful aroma compounds mm -hmm. so actually when i for example when i brought my truffle to you mark i did not uh, give you a truffle that was uh, out of the ground that day right what i would do was i would put it in a container of to cover it up, put it in the refrigerator, and let that truffle continue to intensify and magnify the aroma. So by about the second day or maybe maybe third day, uh, then the, the the burst of uh, is at its peak. And and, and know, I also remember you were you brought truffles that had been cultivated in Australia. Oh and yes, I was. Uh, we had them in the summer. And of yeah. course, that's the fall or winter down there, uh, which were equally remarkable. Yeah. Um, at, at the time I was operating the marketplace, it was a bit difficult to um, get people to pay the, the, you know, the price. But we did it. And of course, I, I didn't always run a restaurant to make money, but um, they are expensive and it is uh, intimidating for an individual. Mark, you know what, what's interesting about what you said about summertime with, with the winter truffle, it's the Australian, of course, their winter, but the trouble is, is our summer food does not fare well. Right. Oh. Well, I'll, I'll eat risotto any time of the year or yeah, pasta any time of the year. put it on, on a 4th of right? July barbecue. You know. or, or in Susie's book, I, I'm gonna, I don't know if I'm going to try it or not. And we talked about it before. You know, earlier she has a peanut butter and truffle recipe. Yeah. I'm not you know, we yeah. want to train our children to love truffles, right? Oh, we got to train yeah. their palates. So if children like peanut butter and they can mix truffles in with peanut butter, which has yeah. that fat, which carries the flavor, why not? Yeah. Um, Everybody or, else. or trout in, in, in brown butter truffles, you know, oh, yes. a, a, a tr brown butter with truffles would be yeah. awesome. And, and, and along that line, what you said about the peanut butter, Susie, is it's hard to conceive of a, you know, think of a mushroom or a vegetable that goes with sweets. I mean, it's awesome what, what a truffle will do. If you make truffled honey or, you know, I, of course, truffles and chocolate will have mm, and truffled ice cream. Oh, and my. Yes, <laughs> you know, like a, a vanilla and, with, and, and a vanilla ice cream with truffles. Uh, is just awesome, or uh, for sweet cream and a cream puff with that the cream has been truffled by by storing it uh, alongside. So I'd like to add here for those of you who may not be so familiar with the cultivation of truffles and the fact that uh, this is something that is now happening on American soil and has been from for some time, thanks to people like Tom Franklin and Betty Garland, all the folks who are involved with the North American Truffle Growers Association, NACA, um, they've done a lot for communicating information to help farmers not have to start from zero with the learning curve. Um, and the great thing is if you manage to find a truffle that's produced on American soil, and we're still at the beginning of getting enough truffles to go around <laughs> to meet the demand. I mean, we're really at the beginning here on our side of the pond, um, but it is so fresh and it hasn't lived with sacks of other stuff as it traveled from Australia or Europe or whatever. It hasn't been peed on by dogs <laughs> uh, unless it was very, very fresh by your own. Oh, I, I thought that was part of the aroma. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> in any case it's so much fresher uh, so we're really really lucky and uh, you know uh, when i heard about tom growing truffles in tennessee i thought what tennessee tar hill truffles you've got to be kidding um you know we're an area that's known for its poverty that's known for tobacco tomatoes at best and to now be producing uh in tobacco growing soils one of the most expensive ingredients in the world it boggles my mind 
may I suggest uh, this when you bring it up, up, Susie, about the local truffles, aside from the freshness, what is so fantastic about it is it runs circles around the European truffles because this is unique to North America without all the competitor truffles that adulterate the European uh, truffles that you, if you buy a truffle from Europe, uh, you may very often, it may be represented as a Perigord truffle, but you'll get an off-grade uh, species that's, that grows right alongside it in Europe called, you know, Tuber brumali or the musk truffle or uh, some of the other uh, somewhat slightly inferior quality truffles. But here in, in America, when we plant the Perigord truffle, that's what you get. You don't get all the other possible Right. You know, adulterant truffles that could uh, that would very be very disappointing uh, the, it, because the worst thing that could happen to you on your first time trying a truffle is you get one of these little dogs and you, then you say what that's a truffle what on earth is all the fuss about and then you, you're you're gonna you know you may lose the chance at the true experience of, of you know the queen of all the black truffles uh, so. So be aware. Try if you can find an American-grown truffle, um, you're going to get yourself a Perigord. I mean, after the area of France. No. So, so Susie, in your research on on your truffles, I want to I want to first read just one of the the introductory uh, quotes that you put in the book. This is not from you. It's from Alexandre Dumas. Uh, he says truffles can on certain occasions, make women more tender and men more lovable. So <laughs> what, what is there to the myths about truffles being an aphrodisiac? I, I know that one of the reasons why pigs in particular are attracted to truffles is that the uh, bouquet aroma, the, the, the volatiles are very similar to the sex uh, aromas that pigs yeah. have. Is yeah. that correct? Yeah. Well, you have to be a little more specific. Um, well, I, I'm I'm a generalist. Yeah. I'm well, no, there, Tom. It's just not any pig. It has to be the sow. The sow oh. is a much better. Okay. Truffle Thank you. Pig, because right. the truffle actually produces a steroid uh, hormone of the male, one of the male sex pheromones. Well, that's why that's why you're here. And and maybe that just that underscores the fact that most men are pigs. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but what what other stories did you come across uh, in your research or or experiences? Well, there's so much to talk about here. It's a vast subject, and I know that we're winding down on time because we do want to include some question and answers soon. So I want to bring to everybody's attention that the Truffle Hunters film is premiering in Asheville today as we speak. Oh, Perfect really? timing to go along with this book. Uh, and it talks a little bit about the mystique, of course, of truffle uh, hunting in Italy specifically, mostly with the older generation. So it's a, it's a little bit of an art piece. But I do encourage anybody who's interested in knowing more about the mystique of truffles to go out and see this film, which is playing at the Grail Movie House, uh, which has recently moved down to the River Arts District near Twelve Bones. Um, they are, as I said, they have a showing today, they have showings uh, tomorrow, and I think on Thursday, and next weekend as well. Um, so check that out. Yeah. And I know that they are restricting uh, moviegoers to 20 per session, so you will be socially distanced and bring your mask and all that. It's uh, relatively safe, as safe goes, if you've been vaccinated. Um, but I wanted to add also, because a lot of people are curious, where can you get truffles, particularly at this time of year? And I will have to say that my, my dear uh, publishers, um, I encourage them highly to um, try to get the book out in the wintertime when we have truffles readily available here in our part of the world, which um, um, April is about the driest month possible for truffles. <laughs> However, uh, I have done some searching today and there are a few places that are marketing the summer truffle already, although um, it seems to me that it might be a little bit early and they may be a little bit unripe for the moment, but you can get uh, the summer truffle, the tuber estivum from uh, Urban 
Milani and from a couple other places. Um, I know that we have a purveyor here in uh, Charlotte, North Carolina named Alex Tosca who um, brings truffles uh, to chefs also in this area. Uh, and there are, there's a list of uh, several places where you can go to uh, in the back of the book for people who are looking for truffles uh, stateside. Of course, in Europe, that's a little bit different. But keep in mind also that the Australian truffle, as Tom and Mark mentioned, is available six months earlier. So in July uh, and a little bit sooner, we'll be getting the tuberous melanosporum coming from Australia. If you want to pay the price to have it shipped that far. But, but Susie, if I could add something to it. Yes. The, the, the aroma profile, the bouquet of the Paragord Black Winter Truffle, then the burgundy black, the black truffle, very similar to the Paragord and that fruits in the fall. And the summer truffle is very similar to the Paragord, except that the aroma profile is quite a bit, uh, it's the same compound, the same smell, but there's not that much of it in a summer truffle. So um, be alert if you want to use the truffles, you may have to use five to 10 times as much shavings or, or incorporation with the summer truffle as you would with the, uh, with the black winter truffle. So, so black winter truffle a little goes a long way. Uh, Mark can speak much better to this, but I just use a rule of thumb of a fifth to a tenth of an ounce uh, can uh, definitely make your entree shine. Uh, but, um, but the pair, but the summer truffle, be, be aware if you do uh, want to pick one up, you know, uh, very soon that it doesn't have the pungency, the intensity that the, that the black winter truffle uh, does. So don't be too quick to judge, yeah, right? Yeah. <laughs> and I'll add a note to that because we talked about this earlier, Mark, um, the other day we talked about truffle oil and Tom, we talked about truffle salt and people will be wondering, you know, if I can buy truffle oil and truffle salt for much less the price than a real truffle, uh, why don't I just do that? And uh, generally speaking, there may be a few exceptions out there. The truffle oil and truffle salt are a synthetic flavor and it's really wow. just one particular flavor that's been isolated. So a uh, real truffle has um, you know, dozens and dozens of volatile compounds. So it's a much more complex flavor. Um, and Tom, I'll, I'll let you to speak to that just in a moment here. Yeah, we are one, one word basically says it all, bismethyl thiomethane. Now, doesn't that sound delicious? <laughs> <laughs> so, but that, but you know how you, you can tell whether you've been snookered or not if you actually get a truffle oil with uh, that has been that that compound has been used in. Uh, if you uh, on on your tongue after you swallow, if you get a metallic aftertaste in your mouth, that, you know, as if you're chewing on a piece of aluminum foil, you get that kind of a experience. That is. Uh, very, indic very indicative that you just got uh, schnookered with uh, this methyl thiol. Yeah, there's nothing, nothing to compare with a real truffle. So nothing. if you're wondering nothing. what on earth does this taste like, if you haven't tasted a truffle yet, uh, the black tr flavor, truffle flavor profile is a little different from the white. The black truffles are, to me, they're earthy, musky, floral, sensuous, pungent, sexy, sweet, dark, dusky, oaky, nutty, savory. If you think... Uh, black olives, sorghum molasses, and dark chocolate. It's sort of that kind of a deep flavor. Uh, and the white truffles, they're earthy, pungent, musky, garlicky, petrolly, almost sharp and spicy, heady and intense. Uh, so think garlic, shallots, Parmesan, uh, which means that they pair with different kinds of food too. The white truffles pair really well with uh, Italian type foods like pizza and pasta with tomato sauce, which the black truffle doesn't pair as well with. The tomatoes kind of fight with the black truffle. So the, um, you know, you can, you can pair your truffle with the seasonal foods. And there's a, there's a passage in the book about that, that gives you a few guidelines for working with seasonal ingredients to go with the different truffles that are available at different seasons of the year. So true, Susie, the ingredients uh, form an ecology, the same way that Italian wines go with Italian foods, go with tomatoes, where burgundies go with you know, the bacons and the fats and the mushrooms that grow there and the cheeses, they're all interrelated. So in thinking about how you cook, uh, it really does make sense to try to 
uh, honor the integrity of the ecology that exists. Well, thank yeah, you. Oh, sorry, Susie, do you want to wrap up? I just up? wanted to, well, while Mark is speaking, I wanted to show folks his uh, book in praise of apples, which I checked today. It's still available on Amazon. So this is a lovely harvest of history, horticulture, and recipes that Mark uh, published uh, some years back. So that's something that you folks can look for as well. Oh, uh, I retired. Apple right that book was my retirement, yeah. <laughs> as well as Appalachian Appetite, of course, if you want some Appalachian recipes with some morels and uh, ramps and other ingredients that we see around today. Um, can, I, can I add something right there? Jump in on that, Susie. Uh, I had the good fortune uh, of being in Susie's good graces that she invited me to a morel hunt uh, this last week. And um, we were almost skunked at finding the morels until she found she found one kind of at the last part of the day and we were, anyway, we brought it plus the extra couple dozen that we found growing all around at home to her house. And she said, I don't have much here to, to help make a meal with this. And so we had uh, what we had morels, uh, you know, the best simplest is, you know, just like with truffles, simplest is best sauteed. Uh, and then we had, uh, then she had the cream, some nettles, and then she had to cream, which she picked out of her backyard and she creamed, she creamed some, or uh, braid, whatever, I'm sorry. So sauteed some, uh, forgive me if I pronounce this, Sanchi. Uh, Sachan, Sachan or Sachani, the, the another, Cherokee herb. Another uh, native plant out there. And then we had some orzo and some pickled mushrooms. And she said, well, this is all I can do. This is all I got here for you guys. It was like a gourmet meal. Yeah, Thirty minutes later, that's what Susie can do. So, that's the oh, the backyard is so generous. Yes, well, that's what your Appalachian appetite uh, connotes. You know, that's the way it works with Susie. So. Well, I'm going to jump in right now uh, to uh, field just a few questions, and also to encourage you to shop with independent bookstores like Malaprop. Yes. So. The A word, we don't tend to uh, encourage or uh, direct. So we hope that you'll always choose an independent bookstore first uh, to help support your community and the people who work and live in your communities uh, every time you think about purchasing a book. Uh, we did have a couple of questions that really address something that I think Susie and Mark and Tom almost uh, psychically uh, anticipated about the summer truffles versus the winter, uh, the aspects of each. One question that was connected to that had to do with truffles stored in oil. Uh, what do you think of that? Is that a good idea and something worth purchasing? Um, I'll let you answer that because that's a very scientific question. Well, that's, that's a, I think the way to, to to think about that question would be the same way you think about, suppose you wanted to make your own garlic oil and you crush up some garlic and then you put it in the oil and the garlic has, is, has moisture in it and oil being lighter than water, it floats on top of the garlic and water to mish. Uh, and, but if you don't use it, uh, refrigerated of course, and you don't use it within uh, X, don't hold me, liable for the number of days, but you don't use it relatively soon, you have uh, the botulism uh, bacteria that will grow in that environment. So th that would be the same thing true then for the truffle, because the moisture in the truffle uh, will be cut when, when it's smothered and out of the out of range of any oxygen, uh, will also foster the growth of the botulism type bacteria. And, you know, these clostridia botulum things are everywhere and, uh, and it only takes one to start the process. And, and so, so I would say be very, be very alert to that fact. And also, for example, when people make honey with truffles, truffled honey, they have to be very careful that the honey that they use has a very uh, high bricks or very low moisture so that you don't get the same difficulty of getting the, uh, the clostridium uh, food, you know, toxic bacteria growing in a mixture of truffles and honey. So, um, 
So I would say, uh, I, I, I don't know if there's much advantage. Store, store your truffles. If you do get a fresh truffle, simply store it. Like I say, keep the aromas uh, in, because they're volatile. They're gonna, they're gonna blow away. So keep, store it always in a container. A little Tupperware or plastic container is fine. And most important, if you want to extend the shelf life dramatically, put that container in your refrigerator in a bath of ice water. Get that thing right down to 32 degrees. Uh, it's a huge difference in the shelf life if, if you store it at a typical 40 degree Fahrenheit temperature or whether you're storing it at uh, 32 degrees. Uh, you can keep a, if that truffle was fresh out of the ground, you know, I don't know what your vendor is going to tell you, but uh, if it was fresh out of the ground, that thing will stay, uh, stay two to three weeks. Uh, I once sold a chef, uh, uh, forgot his name, excuse me, in, in Atlanta, uh, some truffles for Christmas. He called me back at the end of January and said, well, I just used my last truffle I need to reorder. So he was able to keep his truffles for almost a month. And he was, uh, he was very happy with uh, you know, presenting them to his customers. Uh, and that's one of the joys if you're if you're cooking with a truffle yourself if you splurge and you order yourself a truffle which i definitely encourage you to do at least once in your life and uh it probably won't be only once once you've once you've done it the first time is it's your friend it 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 it, it just changes everything in your house. Every time you open that refrigerator, even if you've stored it well, there is that magical whiff. And uh, my children don't appreciate it quite as much as I do. <laughs> Poor things, they had to grow up with truffles coming and going from the fridge when I was experimenting with recipes. But um, uh, it's, it's really, it, it, it will uh, spice up your whole life. Yeah. Think what it's like in a truffle grower's house during truffle season. <laughs> That's what I was saying, walking into that, the the office of the white truffle of Tuscany and then then having it in in a jar in my bedroom in in yeah. the, the villa we stayed in was just overwhelming I, I'd like to you know and th the whole thing about truffles it, it, I relate it to all my food experiences I think in my lifetime maybe there's been a half a dozen bottles of wine that I will never forget and I'll never forget the first time I tasted freshly pressed olive oil that was hours old. I've never had that experience again in my life. And the truffle experience in Tuscany with, uh, you know, finding those just out of the ground and at the height of the season. So um, it's about setting expectations. It's, it's going to be rare that you have that just mind boggling you know, food experience. And I don't try to judge the rest of my life around that. Instead, I appreciate the great fortune that I've had to have had those experiences and to have met the people that have allowed me to have those experiences. And that's, to me, the joy of it all. It's not, I couldn't imagine every day, I, I could not imagine every day having a great aged bottle of red burgundy or the perfect aromatic truffle all the time you know there's life is not that way and for me it's a falsehood to try to pursue that so there's an expectation to set when you go out on this food adventure and that's just to enjoy the to enjoy the ride and and if you do happen to browse the a word website uh anybody that uh, please be aware that Susie's got the inside track on, on the truffles because she's had so much experience uh, working with them. And uh, like, like uh, Mark is explaining there, uh, she, she's, and she's able to relate that experience in her book. Uh, so please, I'm, I'm trying to do a shameless plug here. Uh, oh, thank you. Much better off with Susie's book than any of the other. Uh, More questions. Uh Please browse Malaprop's website and look at the chat where Stephanie has uh, been posting uh, links to uh, books that have been mentioned this evening. So Susie, in the few minutes that we have about three minutes left, can you talk a little bit about your process for the choosing the recipes you chose 
Uh, and uh, anyone in particular that you had to leave out that you say, ah, oh, that one. <laughs> well, sure. I, my taste buds have been forever transformed by the 20 years I spent in France. I grew up here in Madison County in Appalachia with the best of ingredients because my family grew everything we ate. And we went to town twice a year. We spent $200 a year on food and other ingredients. We lived on that a year and we just grew everything. And uh, so I knew what good ingredients taste like. Um, France completely transformed what to do with those simple ingredients. So I took my very favorite recipes from my 20 years of living, traveling around France, eating in uh, really amazing restaurants, but also eating in really amazing home kitchens. Um, so a lot of these are French inspired and a lot of them are with Appalachian ingredients. That's my two loves. I kind of say my uh, what I do is Frappalachian cuisine. It's a combination <laughs> of French and Appalachian. And for anybody who's interested in learning more about that, I do lead monthly foraging trips called uh, Appalachian, Cullin um, yeah, Appalachian Culinary Experience. Uh, I do those the last Saturday of every month. You can find more about that on my Facebook page. Uh, my website's a little bit uh, squirrely at the moment, but <laughs> you can uh, check out Seasonal School of Culinary Arts or Appalachian Culinary Experience and also the Asheville Truffle Experience, which I hope we'll be able to hold next February, the beginning of February. Uh, so you can check that out or always uh, track me down. I'm glad to answer any additional questions you have. And I'm so grateful to Malaprops for hosting this launch as well as the launch of my previous two books and to Mark and to Tom for coming out and answering specific questions and always being there to bounce ideas off of. Uh, you're truly some of the people that I admire and respect the most in this, in this industry. And it's a, it's a pleasure to be around the table with you even virtually, even if we don't have a truffle in our midst, we have good imaginations. Thank you, Susie. And Susie Thank you, Susie. Susie will be signing copies. It's another uh, element of supporting independent bookstores like Malaprops. She'll be signing copies purchased from Malaprops. That information is in the chat, uh, but you can definitely, when you order from Malaprops, request uh, a copy be signed. And Susie has very graciously uh, said she would do that. So we want to thank you, Susie, so much. Congratu congratulations on your latest accomplishment. And I anticipate, although I didn't get to ask you about it, that there's more coming. This is not the end, right? You have some other projects underway? Well, there's another book that is just uh, ready to launch very, very soon. The cover is almost uh, confirmed and uh, there's very little left to do on the interior. And that's a, a book of culinary quotes. So obviously the quotes are from other people, but I've been gathering them uh, over the last almost 60 years and uh, I have put them into different categories with uh, introductions for the different categories. So if anybody's looking for some particular culinary inspiration or humor or whatever kind of wit and wisdom uh, may be in there um, from all kinds of uh, all kinds of the greats who have said fun things to live by. Uh, that should be out soon. Well, congratulations on Cooking with Truffles, A Chef's Guide. You've joined us this evening uh, with Susie God Seguere and uh, Tom Michaels, and we really uh, also, and uh, Mark Rosenstein. We appreciate this excellent conversation. Thank you for joining us. We wish you all well, stay well, and we hope to see you in person and savor a great meal, if not together, uh, maybe sometime in, in your homes. So thank you and have a good evening. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.